literally the best two decisions I've made in my life besides my current missus. <laughs> um, yeah, it is, man. Morehouse and Howard. I loved it. The, the friend, the lifetime friends I achieved there, the knowledge I achieved there, the power I gained in myself and the power I was able to obtain there and just the exposure of meeting different people in different walks of life. Like I said, when you're in the environment with all black people, mostly black men from Morehouse, but even when you walk outside, you saw Spellman, Clark, you saw Morehouse School of Medicine, and Howard, you saw a bunch of black people as well, black men and black women. Like, wow, once again, the narrative of black people are not doing it. Like, come be, be in my shoes for the last seven, nine years, that we're doing it. And all these black people are all in successful spots, wherever career they did choose, whether, whether it's law, business, medical entertainment, they're doing it. They're doing it. It's a beautiful thing to it's a beautiful thing to have, especially when they have their information. I can give them a call and say, hey bro, how you doing? Hey sis, how's it going? And stuff like that. Oh wow. Uh, so you graduate from Morehouse and you don't go like a lot of our brothers do directly to law school. What what made you not want to go directly to us? Were you just figuring yourself out or were you just trying your best to make an impact in the world before you even decided to go into becoming an attorney? Yeah, I mean, honestly, Julian, I was tired. You know, after K through 12 and four years of undergrad, you know, I was just tired. You know, it was just, I, I exhausted all my academic, academic power. I, I cannot be in the classroom no more. I've studied. I've done finals, I've done, you know, reading, I can't do it. So yeah, I wanted to be in the workforce. Um, I knew I didn't want to get a typical job, like I mentioned. I wanted to do, a, I wanted to get paid by helping, me, by helping my people, my community, and by doing something that I love. That's why I chose chess, because fortunately, my mom taught me chess at the age of three. I just loved the game. I loved it. I love the strategy, the mental aspect of the game, how uh, the game resembles a lot about life because every move you make is like a move in life. You make an informed decision and a conscious decision to make a move. Regardless if it works out or not, you thought of the goal, which is checkmate, which is where it may be. Law school, become an attorney, become a judge, become a doctor, be a father, be a be a husband. You make decisions in your life, you know, you know, after after a certain age, you make decisions in your life to put to put you in a better place moving forward. And that's what chess is all about. All Every move I'm making, I'm positioning myself to get checkmate, which is the dream, the end goal. And you know, every position I give up, I may be losing something behind, but I'm gaining something. I thought a two year break was good enough for me. It was, I get, definitely got that hunger back to go back to school. I got that drive back. I was mentally rested. I was emotionally rested. And day one from law school, I, I was on the grind. I bet I'm ready. 200 pages. Let's go. Let's get it. I, no complaint. But I don't know personally for me. Well, like you said, everybody's different. Some people can do it straight from undergrad to law school. And hey, all the power to them. I knew I couldn't do that. Just the way my mind works. I need those breaks. You know when I can. And you know, fortunately, you know, I made it out. You know, on the last day of graduation. What is your advice to somebody saying? Uh, or someone thinking to themselves, if I take a gap year, it'll hurt my application. I mean, no, I mean, the basic answer, no, is not true. You should go to law school or any graduate school when you're ready. You know, society may push you to go right after because they're saying you might not have the determination to go back. And it may, it may be true. Some people, you got to know yourself. You, <clears throat> you got to know yourself. you one of those people when you're out of something for a long period of time, you don't like to go back to, then you should probably not take a break. Probably go straight through. If you're someone who knows yourself once again and knows, I want to go to graduate school. I'm going to make it happen. Then take your year or two break and then go make it happen. But no, it does not hurt your application. I mean, the only difference is they're going to ask you what you did in that year or two. And you can, you know, you can tell the truth. Like, hey, you know, you know I'm, I'm assuming you work in that year or two. So where do you work at? Why do you pick that? You know, whether it's, the congressional house, whether it's working at Kroger, whether it's, you know, doing something, you ought to be doing, I'm assuming once again, you're going to be doing something productive in those two years. Some people say they travel the world. I don't know how you have, how you have money to travel the world, but they do. So uh, you can say that as well. And if you did travel the world, talk about your experiences. If you went to a European country, you went to Africa, 
we went to Asia. Talk about your experience in those countries, but in those continents within those countries, and talk, you know, just talk about it. So no, it does not hurt you at all. I mean, the biggest thing like is about the LSAT, so make sure during those years you take that, if you haven't took the LSAT yet, I think, I, once again, this is back, they may have changed it, but I know the LSAT's probably good for five years, right? Yeah, it's good for five years. Yeah, so most people who want to take a break usually take it their senior year, and then within five years they go to law school. So if you have not taken the LSAT yet, after you graduated, that may be a little difficult because you're not in school mode no more. You're working, paying the bills, and now you got to study too. So my recommendation is if you should take the LSAT while in college. If you don't, then you know just make sure you have a lot of the time to not be working and studying at the same time. Because to me, the biggest thing that a lot of black and brown folks don't get into law school because of low LSAT scores, because unfortunately, we don't have, really have trust funds or parents that can give us like, hey, here's $5,000 for rent. Don't work for three months. We don't have that. And so do it when you're in school where you know, you're already studying for other classes, you can step with the LSAT as well. But once again, everybody's circumstances are different. So moral story, it does not hurt you. If you need to do it, do it. If you're thinking about doing it, then you should probably, you should probably do it. You know, so. I, people, I know people will ask what LSAT score but I mean, you did really, you did well on the LSAT. You did really well on the LSAT. What allowed you to be successful on that test? Um, because you didn't really, take it while you were in school. You took it after, right? I did. I did. Um, I made I made a sacrifice. Um, so my mentor told me a long time ago, you cannot work a full time job. You cannot work a full time job and expect full time results on the LSAT. You can't. Once again. It, this is all a generality. So there's always exception to the rule. Some people can. Some people can work a 40 hour job and still score 160 plus in the outside. And you, can, you guys can do it, go ahead. But for the average person, it's hard to do. I mean, because after a nine to five, you're tired. You know, you get home around six o'clock. Are you really gonna be studying for three to four hours and go back to bed? I doubt it. you're gonna check in with your friends. You're gonna have some, some me time, some decompress time. Cause it's hard to, function for 12 hours straight in straight work. <laughs> That's why we have eight hour work days because we can't do that. I, once I was ready to start, start studying for the LSAT, I, okay, I had to, was turned into my lease. So I had a decision to make, oh, okay, I have to either resign my lease and keep paying this lease for three months as I'm studying or don't resign and move back home with my mom and sleep in my old room or on the couch because my mom changed my room to another room and just you know bite the bullet for three months. And that's why I decided. Because once again, I did not want to be working or worry about money or about bills for those three months of studying. And then, so I went in. You know, I, I treated the LSAT like a full-time job. So from, from nine to five, 10 to six, I was working on the LSAT alone. After that, I, you know, just like a job, I went home, you know, or I stayed home and I, you know, Play the game, talk to friends and family, went outside, went to the gym, you know, just something besides the LSAT, but I did that straight for three months. And that's how I performed well, because the LSAT is, is only difficult because the skills needed to do well in the LSAT you, is not natural to us. Unfortunately, due, due to our education, K through 12, we're taught to memorize more to actually learn, you know? To me, you were taught to memorize an exam, you know, a study review or a guide to prepare us for an exam without actually retaining or holding that information for long periods of time. You know, to me, that's not education. You know, because I can memorize the annual rainfall in Brazil is 2.4 inches, and I don't know that say I just made that up. But um, and now if I sit over here, like, like, yo, how do you know that, man? It's crazy. <laughs> And if I cite that on an exam, now I'm, I'm considered smart. If I memorize the formulas for math, I would memorize the Civil War history and, you know, analyze it and recite it on an essay prompt, now I'm considered smart because I got 95. But to me, that's not education. And it also doesn't, te doesn't test you on education, it tests you on skills. So what's a skill? It's something you have to do over and over again to get better at. You need to practice it, just like a free throw in basketball. You know, the people who are doing free throws, the Ray Allen, Steph Curry, Reggie Millers, they they've done that, they did that every day. 
the shot firing shots every day. Those who are not as well, you know, they practice, but they don't really go as in because yeah, if you do a form, and sometimes it's natural ability, you know, sometimes Shaq's hands are too big, the White Hart's hands are too big, it's too hard to grip the ball. But besides that, yeah, you got to put in the work. You know, R&P, Kobe Bryant, but that's the reason Kobe became Kobe. The man put in hard work every day for every year in the NBA. He didn't even take a day off. He did not. He was in the gym when he saw the – and when rookies got – when the new, like, sensational rookie got in the league, he worked harder to let them know, I know you're, you're still – you're young and nice, but I'm still Kobe. So I'm going to work twice as hard now because now you're in the league. So I remember – I don't know if you guys know Jay Williams – uh, a former guy from uh, he's an analyst now. He was a great player. He talked about a story about Kobe Bryant, about when he got in the league. You know, he was a new sensational rookie. He got to the gym early to practice. Kobe was already there. And so he did his whole workout, and he was tired. And then he, he noticed Kobe was still there. And then Jay was like, dang, Kobe, like, you're, you were here before me, and I'm tired, and you're here after me. He said, oh, yeah, I saw you walk in, so I knew I had to work double overtime. And so he really stayed there just to show him, I see you see me, but I'm going to be here. I was here before you, I'm going to be here after you. Just let you know that I see you. This mentality to always, always prepare, always, ex- always hold yourself to that high standard of accountability. At the end of the day, that's all you can do. People are going to have their own judgments, their own stance about you, but what's your standard? What's your accountability? What are you, how do you judge yourself? What else that? I said, that was that is a priority. What does that mean? That means everything else, if it's not LSAT related, is second nature. Whether it's dating, whether it's family at that time, whether it's friends at that time, whether it's bills at that time, whether it's money at that time. LSAT is number one. And so after the LSAT, quote unquote, all right, y'all, that's not a priority no more. Family, friends, you guys are back. Everybody else, you guys are back. I just, for these three months, I needed to do me, which is why I did not want to pay bills, which is why I did not want to work, because I knew that working pay bills would get in the way of me studying. And that's always the common thing about people. People think they can do the LSAT part-time, three to four hours a day. If you do, what happens? You get part-time results. You get a part-time paycheck. You work part-time. You do it for long periods of time, probability-wise, you probably get a higher score, because that's just probability. So... Yeah. How the heck do you study for law school, man? How do you survive it? I heard you're reading like hundreds of pages a night. How'd you do it? Hey, man, once again, man, it's priority. I learned also, a long time Also, ago. was English your first language? No, no Spanish was. Wow. Spanish was okay. English I learned through speech <laughs> and through just being around English people, English-speaking people throughout my early years. Um... How to stay for law school? I mean, once again, law school. Law school is not difficult. The reason people say it's difficult because you have to learn in a different way that you not that most people are not used to. Once again, there's not K through 12. There's not undergrad. There's no memorization in law school. You actually have to understand concepts and master them and the mastery of them. You can't just memorize. Batteries, the intent to cause a harmful, con- a harmful result and a harmful result resulted. Okay, cool. What does that mean? What does the intent mean? What does it mean? Does it mean purposeful? Does it mean, you know, reckless? Does it mean knowledge? Does it mean conscious objective? What does uh, harmful mean? Does it mean do I must bleed? Do I got to say ow? Does it mean just contact? What does result mean? Does it mean I got to show physical manifestation of the result? Um, same thing with like false imprisonment to the restriction of somebody without means of escape. So what's the physical constraint? If I show you a threat and said, don't move, is that, a, is that enough for false imprisonment? Yes, it is. It depends who coming from. Like if a security officer at the mall said, don't move, and you, don't, and you, and you cannot move, that's false imprisonment. That, that could be a claim for false imprisonment if it was wrong, you know, false imprisonment, but stuff like that. So once again, you can't memorize, you can't just memorize the words. You have to know what the words mean in context through, through different examples. That's what law is all about. The language, the language really doesn't mean nothing. It's the language and the practice of the law. 
um, you know, same with civil procedure, the Constitution, equal protection, 14th Amendment due process. What does that mean? What does that mean having equal protection of the law? Does that mean you are subject to anything? Does that mean you have unlimited immunity for what, what, is, what does free speech mean? Does that mean I can say wherever I want one? No, that don't mean that. That means in certain environments, like public spaces, you can't say you cannot say wherever you want at an airport. Why? Because that's a you know, that's the public space. At a park, yes, you can say wherever you want. It's a park. It's known, it's traditionally known to hold large gatherings, to hold speeches. At school, can you say wherever you want at school? No, you can't. And the school, if you're essentially interfere with the disruption of the school, then yeah, the schools can censor you. You know, same thing with drugs. You can't just bring drugs to school. Um, the courtroom, is the courtroom free speech? Yes and no, you can't not sit wherever you want in the courtroom because that's typically helpful with something. So stuff like that, once again, very new, it's a nuance, that's why I call it. The law is very nuanced. And how you get good at those nuances, you have to study, you have to read, you have to look at different case examples of how that nuance is implemented, how the nuance is extracted in different elements of the law. So once again, that's what I'm saying, it's different. It's not hard. It's just different because we're not used to that in K-12 or in undergrad, all right? I never had to look at five different examples just to get one sentence. I got the sentence, okay. Um, George Washington is the first president of the United States. Got it. That question, who's the first president of the United States? George Washington, answer, got it. This time it's, talk, you know, what, why was George Washington the first president of the United States? And then you explain that to one day. Not, the, the, and the second big thing allows law is there's no right or wrong answer. There really isn't. It's your analysis. You know, remember, there's two sides of argument, pro, con, right side, left side, plaintiff, uh, defendant, you know, the state versus the defendant, whatever it may be. And how do you articulate your points and your facts that support your position in analysis with the law? And how do you portray that to convince a judge or 12 people in the jury box about your decision, you know? So people are trying to find the right answer. There's no right answer. That's why you like, probably it'd be this. More than likely, it would be this. Less likely it would be this because why? Because, you know, two circuit cases in the Eighth Circuit said, you know, this, 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 this. And so because of that, due to this is already president, and then the others have like, well, that's true, but in the Fourth Circuit, if the facts were like this, it, so it's, once again, there's no very wrong answer. It's very nuanced in regards to the way the law is affected. And, and unfortunately, sometimes it's discretionary. You know, the law is really who's behind the bench. And it's told people in the jury box and who's on the Supreme Court. So what, that's not right or wrong. It's, oh, there's the law because at this current time, these group of people or person said so. And then we have to follow that over and over and over again. And so, so once again, going back to your question, that's what makes it difficult because you got to put in work for that. And those first nine months of law school, that's all I did. All I did was read and write every day for about 10 to 12 hours because I needed to recalibrate my brain and how to read. I had to re-study for law school. I had to relearn things. I had to actually obtain, obtain, retain, and master information in my head so that it's there. Not memorize a sentence, not memorize a phrase, but knowing what that phrase means in different applications of that phrase, and what that sentence means with different examples to show me. Like I said, even with criminal law, like the what's murder, the intentional killing of a human being with malice afterthought. What does that mean? What does that mean? Does that include accidental killings? What's mass afterthought? Does that mean premeditation, deliberation, felony murder, the murder of a police officer? You know, it's like stuff like that. Like, what does this stuff mean? And that's what the law is about. If you just put that sentence down on a law exam, you get zero points. Okay, that's just the law. Tell me what that means. And then and the law is like, and then the final exams are like, it's a long fact pattern with different issues. And you can't just put the law, you gotta talk about the law with with the application of the facts of that, of you know, whatever story you have, to think about it. What's the law, you know, what's, what does a client know? The client knows a story. This is what happened to me, or this is what I want to do. Your job as a lawyer is connect their story with the law and make it, you know, 
connect and to help them out wherever they need. Does that make sense, Julian? It makes a lot of sense. So if I am a new kid, I'm walking into law school. First, man, I um, put you on that campus. I mean, your bigger thing is get the books. Get the books. Get, um, your syllabus is now your best friend. If you know a syllabus in undergrad, knowing who to use it, that's all you use for law school. That's all the professor uses. Read the syllabus. Your syllabus lays you out all your readings for the whole semester. You know, unless the professor gives you readings every month and then, you know, you go adjust it to that. But so your, your syllabus is your holy grail. It's like, okay, this is my syllabus. So you know exactly what readings are coming up. So you get the books and you read. The biggest thing is when you have a question, ask a question. I'm not talking about the middle of class all the time, but go to your mentor, go to a second year, third year student, go to the admissions officer, go to the professor during office hours, especially in the beginning, you will have lots of questions. Write down your questions, you know, in a notepad and go to somebody and ask a question. Don't always try to figure it out on your own. Of course, try for some amount of time, but you still can't figure it out, it's okay. That's what the professors are there for. Most, if not all, one of the professors know that students coming in don't know nothing about the law. They don't know anything. They don't know how to issue spot. They don't know the right analysis. They don't know about conclusion. They know this, but they want to be in that position because they want to help you. They want you to come to office hours. They want you to give them practice hypos, which is like practice, you know, exam question, so you can see what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. They want you to do this. Your job for accountability is to go to them. And so my biggest thing is ask a bunch of questions, take away your pride, do the work. Like don't, don't skip, don't shortcut the work. Don't do it. Like you cannot do it for law school. You, you, we all know what finessing and shortcutting meant K through 12 and undergrad. We all just finesse, we are just shortcuts. You should not do that your first year of law school. Some people will. Some people won't. You should not do that because if you don't shortcut, the probability of your success goes higher. If you do, don't mean you won't be successful, just the probability goes lower if you shortcut something. You know, so try your best to just do the work that first nine months, nine months meaning first semester and, and second semester. Because if you do, that foundation in you will only build upon that your second, third year, and you get better and better and better at issue spotting at writing exam answers, at looking at the law, and knowing how to read a case very efficiently. I read cases, I used to read cases three or four times. Now I read them in less than five minutes. I'm like, Bop, Bop. I know I know, I'm, I know how to read them now. Okay, these are the facts, Bob. What's the issue, Bob? Rule, Bob. Answer back, conclusion. Okay, bet. Let's go. Before, yeah, I just take 30 to 45 minutes to read a case. Okay, like I was trying to get all the little details, I try and get all the little, you know, all the rules of law. I try and get all the counter. I try and do it all. And you, you probably should do that the first three or four months because you want to make sure that you're paying attention to being the case. Because the first, the first is going to ask you something that you didn't think about. Like, oh wow, I didn't think about that. The first is going to ask you something about the case that you didn't think was important but was important. So, it's good to do that in the beginning. But once you get more involved in the one-year process, second and third year, you learn more efficiently and better how to read a case. And that just comes with practice. So, you know, I guess the you know, one thing to answer your question to wrap up is don't shortcut your, your foundational process. Don't do it your first nine months. Do the work, do the work, do the work. Second, ask questions, whether that's from your mentor, second, third year, professors, ask questions. Third, don't be prideful, don't, all right? We know you were that person in undergrad, you won't be here. You know, usually people in law school are relatively smart. Y'all got good grades. Y'all did dec decently well in LSAT. Y'all got high GPAs. We get it. You know, everybody's probably like you, so don't be front. Fourth, be, like I said, be, I don't want to say be nice, but just be an open person. Like I said, I've always, like, I mean, once again, this could all be morality and, and philosophy, but, you know, when you give good to the world, good comes back to you. You do. So if you if someone asks you for help, you know, help them. You know, it helps you make sure you know what you're talking about and you, you know, it's a double positive whammy. 
you help them and you make sure you know what you're talking about because you know everybody learns differently whether it's in the visual audio or um kinetic was like moving touching things and so maybe you know you saying out loud like dang i forgot to i forgot about that exception to that rule okay let me do it again for negligence okay keep it going and so and what was my last rule when you're on campus what to do what did i do um i mean once again this i think regardless of the type of person you are you have to network in regards to law school call the laws about is is clientele based and who you know you know and networking is a great tool regards you get good grades or bad grades it especially help you get bad grades because if someone knows if someone knows the kind of person you are in regards to your grades then they will they want to hire you especially for employer employer they want to they know like yeah we get it bro law school is tough and as I don't know if your viewers know this, but law school has a curve as well. It's you know not every, un, not not similar to K through twelve and undergrad. Law school can only give out can only allocate a certain number of grades per class, so per section. So there's there's an incoming class. That class is divided up into sections depending on the number of the class. At Howard is usually three sections. Within those sections, about 50 to 60 people in there with, you know, so in that, in that 50 to 60 people, you'll probably only can give out about four to seven A's, about 18 to 22 B's, 10 to 12 C's, and about four to six D's, give or take, you know? And so that means no matter what, someone got to get the C, someone got to get the D, the B and the A, someone has to do it. And so, you know, and that could be you, you know, I got a C my second semester, and I got to see my second my my second year for semester. But you know it's okay because like bro, it's expected. Like so, don't be too hard on yourself. You get a C in law school. Of course, don't get all C's. You know, get mostly B's. You know, a few A's here or there. But if you get a couple C's. It's not the end of the world. You will be okay. And if you network right, people who understand that will give you the opportunity to will give you the opportunity to still have the job because they understand. Yeah, bro. I got three C's too, but now I'm a partner at a firm. So I know it doesn't tell you nothing. It's what kind of person you are. So make sure you network. Network with your classmates. Network with the class above you. Network with the class before you after you get to your second year. I mean, network with the class, yeah. Network with the class before you. And network with the class after you, after you get to your second year. Because remember, all of them are about to be attorneys. So the more you turn you got in your back pocket, you never know you're going to need an attorney in entertainment, in property, in in um, commercial litigation, in um, you know court, in the courtroom, in energy. You never know, and all these all these students are going to be attorneys in different fields. You just never know. Some people may become judges, partners, you know, general litigators, uh, general counsel at different top companies. So you just never know who's going to be what. And if you're a friend before they make you big, then don't you know. You're a genuine friend, you're not gonna be a friend with them because they make you big, if that makes sense.